I talk a lot about the relative nature of reality. And this is pretty much a podcast about spirituality. And I was thinking about this earlier, is like spirituality. And it's such a broad term. And it's it's very it's a very obvious, obviously like relative term. It's so individualized for everyone. One person's idea of spirituality may be completely different than mine. Um, so I wanted to ask you to start, what is spirituality to you? What does that big word mean? Oh, man, I love it. To me, spirituality is the acknowledgement of something, whether it be this is where you can define it, whether it be a system or an entity or a, you know, a book or a set of wisdom that exists beyond yourself. So anything that or any practice that supports the acknowledgement that you are not like the center of the universe type of thing, that there's like something that exists beyond yourself that is a quote unquote greater than you. And that to me comes in like that can cover religion, it can cover even even atheism to to a degree. It can cover people who believe in the process of space and the cosmos. So I think that's a broad enough answer to kind of cover all forms. How about you? What what do you think it is? First off, I agree with what you said. Um but for me, spirituality is truth. It that's like a, they're almost synonymous terms. But I also agree it's, it's something beyond yourself, like the acknowledgement of something beyond yourself, which is what I found to be true. Um, and I'm pretty sure you mean like when you're talking about yourself, meaning something beyond the ego. Exactly, the, yeah, my mistake. Yeah, I, didn't mean I figured yeah. that's what you meant. Um, but I feel like, because I never really, when I started along this path, um, I never really thought of myself as spiritual necessarily. Um, I found myself in a position of, like, especially with psychedelics, finding a tool that can show me truth. And I was more perplexed with that. That's what kind of brought me in. It's like, wow, this can show me something completely different and give me an experience that is undeniably true to me. True as in it's, it's right there. It's happening. There's no denying it. Um, and I think that kind of just led me into spirituality because it's a good word for what is true, you know, like the spirit, something, a higher self, um, something far beyond what what I have thought my whole life is true. It's like a new new vision on life, a new truth. That's spirituality for me. But I wanted to ask you also, because like I mentioned, I wasn't necessarily a spiritual person and you're my brother. So I know mostly we we weren't raised in any type of religion. Um, we were mostly like atheistic and scientifically thinking. Um, so what brought you anywhere near spirituality? <laughs> I want to start by also saying, along with the word truth, the word why, as in like the why, that is also, I think, synonymous with spirituality. Um, and both the why and truth, I think, are like the same thing. Yeah. Um, but what brought me to spirituality was Terrence McKenna, <laughs> because he brought me to psychedelics. And, you know, when he would talk about psychedelics, he would talk about them as like a panacea of knowledge and access to reality. And to me, there's always like this little void that I felt because I was so invested in like the scientific framework that I would often try to expel my atheism like onto things. And that's not compatible. Like atheism isn't compatible with reality. And I realized that as I started to learn more about what the world is, what philosophy is, what the mind is, what really hit it home was starting to discover what we don't know. And when you realize that there's just so much that we don't and cannot know, 
you seek ulterior forms of information. And McKenna and some of these other people that I would listen to would just go on and on about psychedelics and especially mushrooms and DMT and how they can expand consciousness and they can expand um, your, your conception of what reality is. And I was reading this book called Biocentrism by uh, Dr. Robert Lanza. Have you heard of this book? Mm, it sounds familiar, but I haven't read it or anything. It was the perfect segue into psychedelics and into this frame of thought because it's a book that essentially presents a new scientific framework that's based on consciousness being fundamental. And it was the first time I had ever heard or read anybody talking about consciousness being fundamental. So for me, when I heard Terrence McKenna and Alan Watts and all these spiritual people start to talk about the uh, potential for psychedelics to expand consciousness, I thought, well, this has a lot to do with like the things I'm reading in this book. And I read another book um, called Freedom from the Known by Krishnamurti. And after reading some of those stuff, some of those things and listening to, again, Terrence McKenna, uh, the rubber met the road when I really experimented and took psychedelics. And then when you have that feeling, it just, it validates everything that you've been reading and it makes you realize like, oh, okay, like this is what they're talking about. It's real yeah. and it's more real and it feels different than they said, or than I could possibly have interpreted it. And I think the the foundational like bottom line here of this whole rant is that when you expand your consciousness to a point where like the mushroom in my case helps you to feel what the divine is, so to speak, that's when everything changed because it was no longer something I was reading or listening to. It was experiential at that point. Yeah, it brought all those words to life. And it is something like so hard to describe in words. And those people that you named do so such a good job at doing that. Um, I like also the word knowledge that you said. That's another one for me with spirituality. And you also said, um, what is? And I think like spirituality is the is, you know, what is the is and just ising. <laughs> well, they say uh, like in Buddhist thought, isness, you yeah. know, isness. Yep. Um, teaching, teaching yourself how to be also being isness, all those things. And it sounds like so simplistic and almost novel. Like, I don't know how to really describe it, but that is what spirituality is to me and it feels it feels with psychedelics having brought into my life it's like that is a a confirmation as you said of all the things that you've heard and things that maybe you've had glimpses of in your life like i've had uh a little taste of the divine in dreams sometimes and then to have the psychedelic experience it's overwhelmingly mind altering like it's so far out there that it opens a gate that like you could never close you can't shut that gate once it's open i so it's it gave me an entirely different perspective on reality and another interesting point is that along with like giving you access to an experiential divinity it addresses the questions of the universe, the large questions that we thought were unanswerable. It gives you the closest thing that you're ever going to get to a potential path forward to understanding those big questions and their potential answers. Yeah, it can, it can speak to you in something more profound and beyond language. Um, like I've talked about, you know, my DMT experience on here. and. When I got the message of this being or whatever it was that I was like falling in this love, I don't know, just getting hit with love by this thing. And it by the end of the trip, it said, I am you forever. But it didn't say it in words, it, but it was a clear message. And I can't describe how it said it. And it did it in a way that when it said that, I felt what forever was. So you can't get that experience any other way. So I felt, you know, 
being brought together with this thing and I felt what eternity is. Like it was, it made me realize, and this is another thing I've read or I've heard people say and had a, you know, somewhat of a grasp on that eternity is now, eternity is all that exists. You know, there's no time doesn't exist, that type of thing. And, but in that moment, it was like a pure knowledge of, and like pure isness of eternity and realizing in that moment that this, this is what eternity is. And that's all that there actually is just being in the eternal now. And that was something that, you know, I can say the three words, I am you forever or four words, (laughs) but, uh, it doesn't, it can't, uh, give you the message that I was given by that like those words are the only thing I have to bring out of it to tell other people about it. But what happened in the experience, the message, the knowledge that came with it was just so much bigger than anything I can imagine. And like you try to, you know, put yourself back in that space or try to feel it and you have just like a taste of it. It's almost like a dream. You know, it happened. You can can remember it, but you can't experience it fully like you had in the moment. And you bring up the timelessness of it or like the sense of like time not being what it is as we understand it in like a linear fashion. Like the first time that I was like really, really deep on a psychedelic experience and I thought that like, I don't know, an hour and a half had gone by and it was only like 12 minutes or something. I I was like, oh my gosh, like that, that, that notion that time is almost defined in those situations by what you feel and like the number measurement of time doesn't coincide with that the fact that you can separate those two so dramatically was very weird to me very mind altering and it changes the i mean it's these little things uh, and you know as well as the huge experiences that just change the way that your mind perceives what you think reality is because we base reality off of time um, and events that coincide with a measurable limit of time. And again, when you can separate like what it feels like to be under the influence of something for 10 minutes and what it actually was, um, or what it feels like to, to, to experience time longer than what it actually is like in this quote unquote physical reality that redefines what's possible. Yeah. And it's just it's the relativity of the relativity of it all that is shown to you through the psychedelic like einstein you know you said well time is relative there's no such thing as like an absolute time like it, but with the psychedelic it's just shown to you so clearly in like such a such a huge way i forget what uh einstein he said something about um time being relative by how long five minutes feels when you're with the love of your life versus five minutes in hell or something, you know, whatever. And that's a way you can think about it. And it's actually true. You think about the time or if you're doing something you enjoy versus just like driving in a car mindlessly, the time is different. You experience it differently. And I think psychedelics really show you that one time when I was uh, having a trip with some, some of my friends, I was, sitting on the floor across from a friend and we were like having a moment together like talking it felt it, this is my memory of the experience so i was sitting there talking with him and it felt like we were figuring it all out man like not like by talking about the meaning of the universe or anything it was just our words were flowing so good to each other like we were talking about everything and i'm sitting there having this experience with him like I mean, everything from our favorite foods to what water tastes like. It just felt like we were communicating everything you could imagine. And it felt like we were there for hours and hours. And it was literally one minute. One minute felt like hours. And that blew my mind. It's just something that is weird. Like psychedelics to me are something that we experience all the time. It's just something we're always experiencing in reality. But the psychedelic shows us the extremes of it. It makes the the truth more apparent. Um, yeah, like that experience was just mind blowing. <laughs> and I like to describe it as it shows you more and more reality 
with the dose, the higher the dose, you know? So it's like, how much, how much reality can you take? How much of what is real? If something was omniscient, if you got to speak with God or who, or whatever you believe, and it told you, it just gave you reality. It was teaching you what reality was. That's what I kind of describe it as. It's like the mushroom or the psychedelic with each passing moment. It's just giving you more and more reality. And at a certain point, like, at least for me, like, I can't take it. It's just, it's so real. It's so raw and it's so beneath the surface, so under the veil that it's like too much. And, uh, I think Terrence McKenna, he always had this little funny, uh, thing he used to say where he, it was something like, like that, where it's like, you know, it shows you, you know, everybody gets to a point. No, it was Alan Watts. I think it was where, uh, you know, the psychedelic is just hammering you and it's good. You're going so deep, you're going so deep, so deep. And you get to a point where you're like, oh, well, okay. And enough of that, you know, that's too far, too deep. And I think every human has that, that wall that it, that it, where it becomes too, too much, too deep, too real. And it's almost like with each, like with more work that you do, you like extend the distance between you and that wall. So you can take more and you can handle more reality and handle more and more with each trip or each, you know, whatever it is that you do. Yeah. It's interesting though. It's, I, I totally agree. It, the good thing about doing the work outside, like the integration is that you usually, you know, you're more prepared for the next time and you can push yourself a little more and you can handle reality better because you already know a little bit, but it's crazy because it, almost never gets easier though <laughs> it's interesting you you feel like you can handle more and you can but you're still gonna push that boundary as long as you either took a high enough dose or if you're in the right mind space if i i'm of the opinion that of course you take higher doses you're gonna see just things that you can't imagine but even on you know an, a slightly lower dose i'm not talking like tiny but if you're in the right meditative state, if you can really relax yourself and just, you know, lay with your eyes closed, listen to music, maybe not, whatever, you can you can go far with even, you know, lighter doses. Um but if you're going if you're going to go in my opinion, anytime you're over four grams, it's it's a wrap. You're gonna see something or you're going to learn something about yourself or about reality and usually get at least at some point, you're going to get to the spot where you're thinking, okay, all right, this is too much reality. For me, it's usually around the four gram mark because I can do an eighth and usually just have a really good introspective experience, um, feel things that feel like divinity. Um, but I feel like right once you hit four grams, it's like, now I want to show you something that you don't know, or you know what I mean? Something a little more intense. And those are the crazy thing is these a lot of people would describe these experiences maybe a bad trip because it goes too far. But these are the trips that you really remember. And these are the ones that are that will teach you the most. In my opinion, um, I had that experience one time when we took four grams and I was stuck in a loop. And for anybody who's who's done mushrooms and has been in one of these loops. I mean, I feel for you because this was rough. Um, it felt like like eternity was happening, but not in a single moment, in like just a loop. And I was going through like this feeling of dying, and that's basically what it was—a feeling of dying. And uh, this felt like it was going to happen forever until I decided to actually die. Like I had to die for it to end. And then what I did was I was so tormented. I was like fuck it, I'm going to die here. That's the only way this is going to end. So that's when I let go. And then it was instant beauty. And just my body was all of a sudden filled with like ecstasy and love. And it was like, oh, I can breathe again. And I wasn't in the loop. And it was just a, a huge lesson to me for, taught me to be able to let go and just kind of let, I don't know, what, Word. <laughs> surrender maybe yes that's the word um it taught me how to surrender just let go and surrender and it's not the end of the world basically and i think that 
that's going to allow me to go a little further in my next trip. I know it's going to be hard, but you're always going to get to that point where you have to surrender and you're going to be holding on because we're so attached to what, what reality we think we know. We want to hold on to it. Yeah. It's like when you're there, when you're, when you're on that come up experience, like before you, uh, you peak and ultimately hopefully surrender, it's like all the alarms are going off in your, in your brain. It's like your brain is good. is trying to convince you that you're dying essentially. And, you know, the first time you hear the alarms go off, you want to get out of the building as quickly as possible and as frantically as, as possible. So you begin to control and fight the experience. But hopefully, as you progress in this work, you know, the alarms don't startle you as much because the alarms are going to go off. And from, for some people, they go off louder than others. But when they do go off, hopefully you're able to then tell yourself, to surrender train that as terence mckenna would say train the hind brain train that fight or flight um motivation to uh to just be here now and be still and then when you tell yourself that you get you know sometimes when you tell yourself that and you get hit with just something unimaginably more intense than you thought could happen and that's why it isn't that easy to do sometimes like you can't, when you're on a psychedelic, you can't tell yourself that you're on a psychedelic. You can't be like, okay, this isn't real. I'm just on drugs right now. That's not how it works because it is real. The experience is real. You're, you're going to have to go through it. And trying to fight it and tell yourself like, oh, I'm just on drugs. That's the opposite of what you want to do because I've done that. And that usually just, uh, you know, pulls you into a black hole of dread. Um, so yeah, surrender is is the one of the biggest things I've learned because that's a in my opinion that's a big lesson in life in general because that's the thing with especially with shrooms in my opinion is they don't just teach you about just like the big questions of reality it teaches you like life lessons and it's interesting because the things you learn about yourself the life lessons also usually apply to reality it's like this symbiosis where it's like it kind of just reassures and morphs the idea that you are reality there's no separation um i think that's one of my favorite things about shrooms is it really it it's not all metaphysical it's it's something that you can actually use to improve yourself and at the same time it does apply to the metaphysical usually they're like myth makers. They, they create myths out of the deepest archetypes of your psychology. And that's why the hero's journey myth like maps onto a psychedelic experience like almost perfectly, which is so cool. And you can bring those stories out of, of an experience and you can understand myth and understand those stories more for what they are supposed to mean. Like uh, the Bible, for instance, I think is very much more understandable after you take psychedelics yeah i i don't i mean i talked about this a few weeks ago but after psychedelics i've had a whole new appreciation for religion so when i was an atheist i thought religion was just the dumbest thing in the world and i thought it was evil and religion causes all the wars and it's just bad and you're dumb for following it and you shouldn't do this and blah 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 and that was me as an atheist whereas now I'm not an atheist at all, and though I don't follow a religion, I really respect them, and I feel a little bit of a connection towards each religion. Like it's something, there is some divinity in them. It's like try, it's pointing at the divinity, but in using language and like human articulation, it's just not possible to do. And I think clearly religions have been, you know, modified through the years to be used as control mechanisms, you know, it has to be what you make it basically. They're all pointing to the same thing. It goes right back to when you asked me earlier about what my definition of spirituality is. It's like every religion, every, you know, spiritual philosophy, like we're all pointing to the same thing from just a different perspective. I was thinking what, what I wish they had a, a university for psychedelics. And that might sound like weird, but that would be a real institute of learning, like a 
a building where you go in with hardened people who are ready to test the boundaries of reality and push their minds to a place in safe environments, in uh, environments catered to psychedelic experiences and, and like uh, divine experiences. You know, think of the money they put into one university. Imagine to build a psychedelic university and the people that would go there and the art and ideas and creativity that would spawn from something like that. I'm just surprised that doesn't exist. Like, I would love to do that. And I think, you know, it's it wouldn't be for every... Nobody wants to do that. That's the thing. You'll get a group of really interesting people who are willing to put themselves through that and really test the boundaries of the mind and see what you can come what you can bring out of something like that. I was just thinking about that today. And I was like, that would be the most amazing, you know, I think it would bring a lot of great ideas, great art, all that. Apparently these were a thing. They were called mystery schools. and Or just temples even. A lot of the temples supposedly were used this way. I believe Dennis McKenna is creating one. It's called the McKenna Academy. Uh, the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy or something like that. And that's kind of his goal is to make a like a school for these alternative, you know, modes of thought. It seems obvious, right? I don't know. I mean, it seems obvious to do. Um, anybody who is taking psychedelics, quote unquote, seriously, um, you know the power that these things hold. Um, I heard it's pretty interesting. I heard that they I forget where one of these research institutes or something they're uh keeping people in the peak of a dmt experience for an hour um so they're giving them an iv drip of of dmt and then holding them in the peak for an hour i could not imagine that and i guess what this is the quote i heard that they are mapping the dmt realm i don't know what to think about that this is called uh the dmt x program um, it's happening in Imperial College, which is in London. Um, and if actually, if you want to, anybody wants to know a little more about it, in episode thirteen, I think, when uh, I talked to Daniel McQueen, he is uh, actually a part of this program. So we talk a little bit about uh, just that aspect of it, which is like mapping the DMT world. Um, and the late great Kalindi Ee would talk about this as well that they're creating like quote-unquote town squares for people to go into the dmt realm and like meet up or something which is just strange to me yeah i don't this is what i want to ask you then do you think you can map the dmt realm i just don't see that as a possibility so it feels to me like the dmt realm has some sort of a structure to it so I think if something has a structure to it, you can map it in some sense. Like there's a consistency to maybe places you can go or entities you can see. And if that kind of consistency proves to exist over time and over like multiple visits, I think that there is a way in which we can map it, but it's not going to be the same way that like you would go and map the Empire State Building if you went inside it or something like that. It's not like a physical mapping, but I mean, <laughs> that in itself is something that like just brings into question all of everything I've ever been taught. You know, like you have to break down your paradigms to even like begin to try to map something that's not physical. It's not of this world. Yeah, it's um, to me, it doesn't seem possible. I think that it's worth doing and I think you could probably uh, find some structure, and but I think mapping is a strong word because it's first off, it's infinite. You know the 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 amount of different experiences people have on DMT. It's crazy. It's like this is another thing when people some people go to the same place every time. Other people go to different places, but it's the same place. It's interesting. I just don't know if it could be mapped. But I think that's an awesome thing to do, and I'll be curious. To, they'll be working on that forever, I'm sure. <laughs> that's the kind of research I want to see, though. I don't really – I mean, of course, you know, you love to see the clinical trials from MAPS, and you see Compass, who is like, you know, uh, there's problems with Compass as well with their, you know, patenting of uh, certain distribution methods for psilocybin and, and all of that. Yeah, that, 
the corporate model is is so weak. It don't we don't want that to poison psychedelics. No. Oh, speaking of which, did you see um, in Colorado they they decriminalized uh, psilocybin, DMT, yeah. and a few other uh, psychedelic plants? So yeah, I heard that because I was at work on break, and one guy I work with, he's a really cool dude, but he's like seventy two. He's awesome. I heard him. He's looking at his phone. He starts laughing. He's like, oh, oh, God, Colorado. And he's like laughing and saying, oh, they're legalizing mushrooms. And he's laughing about it. I'm sitting there just like, so, you know, <laughs> I don't say anything. But it was funny to see somebody, you know, that it's crazy because especially, you know, the older generation. Um, it seems like the idea of psychedelics is changing now, but people still have this goofy idea of what they are. And you can't change their mind. It's impossible. Um, it's something that has to be experienced for you to know the truth of it. Um, but yeah, it was funny watching this guy joke about it. I was like, man, if you only knew, you know, just dose them up. Well, you know, you know. Yeah. It's amazing to start to see, like, the governments of our of our world acknowledge that psychedelics are, like, not something that should be criminalized and. I mean, the scheduling of drugs in general, just the Controlled Substances Act structurally is so flawed and so dumb. Just the way that each schedule is determined, like, um, I don't know. It, it makes, makes no, no sense. sense. It makes yeah. no <laughs> sense. I mean, even the descriptions of each schedule i don't think make much sense either because we don't have a comprehensive understanding of how to use drugs in a healthy way enough to like presume that we can put together this structure of schedules that tells us what we should and shouldn't use it makes no sense and mostly a lot of it is um the way they schedule a lot of it is like if it has a medical use and almost all the drugs that say that they say doesn't have a medical use actually do it's kind of crazy um but this is the one of the things i love graham hancock for so much when he says like do we really live in a free society if we don't have control over our own consciousness like the one thing that is truly yours thing that dictates all of reality your reality you don't have the freedom to explore it. It's just mind blowing, and you know, it's not a free society if you can't if you can't do that. But you can drink alcohol no problem, which is, you know, my opinion, far more dangerous, you know, to your health, to others. You know, people don't take shrooms and go and fist fight. You know, um, they don't. Hopefully, don't drive cars. I'm sure some. That's the thing with. We're going to see some shady shit now with the legalization of psychedelics. There's going to be some people that are going to give it a bad name, I'm sure. Um, hopefully that doesn't, they don't politicize those cases so much and try to make an argument to take them away again. So we don't know that might happen. Yeah, I'm sure there will be pushes some places to do it. I mean, the transition is going to be slow, although it's been kind of quick. But the, the medical model is, I don't think there's any way they can turn that back, you know? I mean, dude, they did, though, because in the 50s, the studies on LSD and psilocybin were groundbreaking for mental health, and they still shut it down. It, it's like it could happen at any moment. Well, yeah, anything can. That's true. But um, now I think the, more, the reason I think the cat's out the bag is because there's with the internet there's so much information on it helping so many people and the you know there's really no bad effects to the health like your body is not going to be poisoned like some people say it's poison it's not it's like completely syncs up with your brain in a symbiotic way it's not poison i'm talking about mushrooms but um probably all of them um well it depends i mean yeah. oh uh ibogaine is another one that they legalized that one is touchy. I don't think ibogaine should be used uh, unless you're with like a, tr a traditional shaman because that is dangerous for you. It can be yeah. dangerous. Well, that you can die from that, right? You can. Yeah. 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 That's a whole different, different than what the tryptamines. Um, what do you, what do you know anything about the Torah? I've heard about the Torah. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard descriptions. 
I that's would never no, yeah. take the Torah. That's like a straight disassociative. Yeah. That's another gnarly one. That's not even a, a psychedelic, really. I think it's more of just a pure hallucinogenic disassociative, like you said. Yeah, it's not a tryptamine. It's not related to like, you know, DMT, psilocybin, and LSD. Like they're all those three are pretty close. And, you know, you have some other ones too. Um, that's the three amigos right there. Yeah, that's the three amigos, yo. That's the the basic three. You start with those, you'll be good to go. But um, I mean, dude, there's so many. Like they call they're calling them designer drugs. I mean, there are so many derivatives of like yep. psilocybin, psilocin, and DMT, like four ACO DMT, two CB. There's just so many. It's it's these research chemicals, yeah. basically. Like in China, they have these labs. Like you can go online, and this is why I think a lot of drug dealers are doing. You can go online and with like Bitcoin or PayPal, probably even you can go to these weird research chemical websites. And I think this is what a lot of drug dealers are doing, because you can get like fentanyl, like a big bag of it for like dirt, dirt cheap. And it's just like fentanyl with one molecule changed or something. And same with other, you know, popular substances. They just are constantly changing just like a molecule here, a molecule there. And you know, finding a loophole to sell it legally and ship it to Americans. And that's what I think they might be doing, putting it in all the drugs and, you know what I mean? You know, they say that's what's happening with these uh, these psilocybin chocolate bars that are becoming so prevalent nowadays. They say that what's actually in those is 4-ACO-DMT, which is a very close relative to psilocin, which is what psilocybin breaks down into in your stomach when you're eating mushrooms. Um, and that's super interesting. Uh, because supposedly uh, you don't get nauseous with uh, 4-ACO DMT. Like there's a few different uh, like attributes to it, like physically, but it'll give you essentially the same experience as psilocybin. Years ago before I've had, um, in this time I've already had uh, mushroom experiences, but it was before I've taken them in like a self-exploration spiritual manner. It was, when I would just take them recreationally every once in a while with some friends. Um, but I took uh, N-Bomb. Oh, you took 2-5-I N-Bomb? Yeah. Oh, no. So I didn't know what it really was. I know it looked like an acid tab, and this person was selling it, and they told me what it was, but I thought it might... I don't, I don't know what I thought, but I took that, and that shit was very strange it was i knew it wasn't acid you know what i mean it was something else but that i don't know if that's kind of like one of those weird chemicals that are out there and who knows how many of those there are now like we mentioned the the three the big ones dmt psilocybin and, and lsd and those are a sure thing but now there's like thousands of psychedelics and they're just you know you don't know i i mean i don't know that is one on the outside that I did take the end bomb or whatever. That's what it is. Is that what? Yeah, I believe it's, it's called two, five and bomb. Yeah. And yeah. yeah it's, um, it's crazy. And yeah, that wasn't, I wouldn't take that again. It didn't, I mean, I didn't know what I was getting myself into anyway, but that just, it felt dirty, you know, it didn't feel like mushrooms. It didn't have that, you know, symbiotic feeling with me. It just was a little more, dissociative and it was i was you know i was watching the movie cruel intentions that 90s movie oh, you ever man. see that yeah. movie? <laughs> and i was stuck on the couch and it was the most evil thing i've ever seen it was just that movie is pretty dark actually it was very cruel <laughs> its intentions <laughs> were very cruel and yeah but it was the whole movie when i was watching it because i was supposed to like do it with friends and so and it was all bad i um what happened was I was working third shift at the time and I just got out of work. So it was in the early morning and I got this stuff and I had taken Ambien too. So this is just a nightmare I'm, I'm putting myself into. Um, and so I started like falling asleep after I took it. And then I woke up and everybody was like, you know, going back to their own house. So I went home and this is hitting me and I'm by myself. I ended up being stuck on the couch watching Cruel Intentions. And it was just horrible. And, like, everything on the screen, like, all the people, looked like they were sketched in, like, a real, like, dirty-looking sketch. Like, it was all cartoony. 
It was horrible. But um, yeah, I was stuck there. I couldn't get up. Take the, it was a DVD. <laughs> I couldn't take the DVD out. Um, I was fucked. But the thing is, when the movie ended, it was an amazing experience. That movie ends with the song Bittersweet Symphony. Oh. And and like it was the culmination of this hell finally ending. And that song is so like uplifting. And I was like, that was amazing. But I learned my lesson not to take that and definitely not with Ambien. <laughs> you know? <laughs> How long did that experience last for you? Uh, I would say <sighs> Was it as long as a typical acid trip? Yes. Ship? Yeah, it was like a typical length. And it's hard to say also because the ambient with it too because like I kind of felt and it was after a third shift uh, working. I was working third shift. So it was after that. So maybe after like five, six hours, I was ready to sleep and I went to sleep. But it was, you know, it was about the same, I think. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. Yeah, I mean, I hear a lot of uh, people going to like festivals and they're getting acid you know whatever is on the tab is what's on the tab right. a lot of times it's m bomb because yeah. uh there's a lot of these uh little organizations that will go to festivals and they have like test kits and you can bring your drugs to them and they will test it for you which is really nice i think that's starting to get pulled back a little bit because there's a lot of risk involved there but a lot of people have reported that they're just getting n bomb as opposed to you know acid yeah well this person had gotten it like I think under the impression that they're going to be selling acid to people and just calling it N bomb. And it's like, but that's actually not acid. Looks like it, but it's not. Yeah. Um, yeah. This person didn't know what they were doing or what they were giving people, which is also kind of scary. <laughs> and that's what happens when drugs are illegal, kids. Mm -hmm. You have to get them from the streets and there's no regulation and you have no idea what you're getting. You don't know the dose. And that's, I don't think, I don't understand how people don't realize the problems with you know, making drugs, all these drugs illegal, I think it's obvious. It's an obvious solution to legalize and regulate. There's like hundreds of thousands of people dying from fentanyl every year, every year. And um, it's not because these people, it's not on purpose. It's always accidental overdose because they don't know what they're getting. If, if fentanyl itself was legal and people were, you know, educated on the dose and you could go somewhere and get the proper dose, I bet the overdoses, the numbers would be cut to like a quarter less, way less, I bet. Um, it's like, how many people do you hear about uh, accidentally overdosing on Percocet? It's like not many. They're like oxycodone. People don't really overdose on that unless it's like a kid who doesn't know what they're doing still. and um, Or if it's on purpose, if someone's trying to kill themselves and they take a bunch of pills the biggest problem that people have a hard time grasping is actually allowing someone to go to a clinic and get like, you know, injected heroin, you know, people were like, no, you can't do that. But like, what's the alternative? Like that, that is, I think a, a very good way to promote like healthy use of drugs. Cause the fact of the matter is as an adult, you can use drugs in a safe way. You just have to know how to do it, you know? And again, but it has to come from like a safe place. Like you said, if you're taking a prescription, you're probably not going to die from no, it. But yeah, I mean, it happens, but. Because it's advertised as the strength, you know, the strength. Exactly. And um, that's why I have like a vision of what it should be like a store. Like everybody, I'm putting myself in the situation of, you know, being educated. Like you educate the people at a young age, what the drugs are and what the dose is. Like the same reason that we know how much to drink and how much not to drink. Uh, so if like, you know that 25 milligrams of, of heroin will kill you, then you get like two milligrams, you know what I mean? So people are educated and know exactly what the dose is they're getting and that it's going to kill them if they take three of them. So they don't take three of them. And like you said, uh, you mentioned heroin and, you know, now they, they want to close down these clinics where they give people free needles and let them, like, safe injecting sites. Um, I think that's, like, a start. Still, you know, they don't know how pure the heroin is because, dude, now there's, like, no such thing as heroin. No, you're right. It doesn't exist, especially not, like, in our, where we live around. Like, it's not a thing anymore. It's all fentanyl and probably my, what I think it is, is probably these research chemicals. Like, um, because people can get it. It's so much cheaper and so much more powerful. So you you buy heroin from somebody, you're not getting heroin. I bet 
nine out of ten times it's it's fentanyl now yeah i mean i've heard that uh these people are getting them like ones who are uh selling them over social media and over the internet i heard that they are getting them from china as well like china is like making these like makeshift bullshit batches um and then they'll get basically turned into pill form and since the dosage is so fucked up on what they're getting from china like one pill uh or two or three different pills like they're gonna widely differ in dose so people are taking what they think is like a half of a pill and i'm like all right i'll be fine and then they're dying because of this there's no regulation they're getting them from a source that has no body to like care about your well-being yep these chinese man they're, they're doing it right you know what they're doing but um, and they're eroding us from the inside yeah, out exactly and but yeah that's where all these research chemical labs are and um it's funny you mentioned like the pills uh so years ago i think this was right when the fentanyl was starting to be a thing um i had a friend who would buy xanax bars and he would get them at a good deal. And I, I don't know the details of it, but he got them from someone who, quote unquote, made them. They were like one of these research chemical pills or something. So they think it's Xanax. And you're right. The do it was supposed to be two milligrams, like a Xanax bar. And then I get this kid took them and he was like dying on the floor. It was fentanyl. It's like nothing close to fentanyl should be in a Xanax. You know what I mean? But that's the danger of this. You think you're taking a two milligram Xanax which cannot kill you. It's impossible. And you take one of them, and next thing you know, you're about to die. Um, that's sketchy business. And this is all coming from uh, thinking that you're going to legalize drugs and it's going to help people somehow. Yeah, it's a very touchy subject because it's so unpredictable in how any action that we take is going to turn out. Because you want to say that all drugs should be legalized and just regulated, but you know, you can't really predict human behavior in a society that was built on the kind of drug education and drug laws that we have, and how that can possibly transition to like a more responsible system. It that might there might be like some growing pains there. I agree, and that's why I think it starts with education is the most important part of that. I think that's where it starts, and kind of you know shape the public's mind about what drugs are and what you're doing and the whole consciousness aspect of it and kind of normalize it in a sense but not promote it you know because my thing is this i think it should be legalized and, and regulated 100 percent because even though it's not legal and or regulated now it's illegal but everybody is still getting the drugs it's not stopping anybody from getting drugs you can get them on your phone now. People just go on, you know, Instagram or Snapchat and you can get the drugs so easily, any drugs you want, except you don't know the dose. And, you know, it's it's just fueling this whole fucking dark underground market online. And it's just not good. I think education and uh, regulation is the way to go. But like you said, I think it has to start from the bottom up. You can't just legalize it and throw it on the country i think it has to you have to shape the minds differently about how we approach drugs altogether well maybe the beginning is legalizing cannabis psilocybin dmt so people can understand like there is a responsible way to approach drugs even drugs that you think are like terrible and poison like because our propaganda in this country and around the world has made us believe that you're being poisoned when you eat these mushrooms or, you know, DMT is like so crazy. Like, why would you ever smoke that powder stuff? You know what I mean? Like, it just, it seems bad. Um, but it's just perception, man. And it's, it's, it's been formed by propaganda. Yeah. And well, I think, especially like you said, the, the psychedelics, I think those are a no brainer to legalize. And I think in reshaping our society, I think it could be used as like an incredible tool because I think one thing we lack in this country, and not just the one thing, but a huge thing about it, and especially I notice this in like young men, there's no um, initiation process. There's no thing you have to overcome and then become a man. Like 
this has always happened in tribes and other cultures. There's like a point in your life where you had to overcome something or do a task, whatever. Like the Spartans would throw their kids out into the woods and say, kill a wolf or something. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's some initiation process. And then you can overcome and then you're a man. You're deserved of the people around you. You're given respect and you're part of the community. And we have nothing like that. But just a simple re-education and using like psilocybin or something like when you're 18 or whenever, when you hit a certain age, you're going to take this sacrament and have the experience to touch the divine. And then you're a man and then you can have an understanding of reality. And then you're, you know, connected with your tribe and connected with people around you and have a shared experience that you can bond over. I think it could be used. Any psychedelic could be used in a way like this. I mean, I'm sure they've done this in, in, uh, you know, tribes and cultures throughout time. I think it's a perfect initiation, you know, sacrament for people. There's no better initiation I can think of. And yes, it has been used for thousands of years in other cultures. Ayahuasca, particularly, mushrooms. Those are the two that I can think of off off the start. Um, peyote as well. Yeah. Peyote, I think, is really nice too because it really connects you. Well, hopefully, if anybody's doing mescaline, it's not through peyote because peyote is like an endangered plant. Um, go get San Pedro. You can buy it at Home Depot or whatever. Um, but San Pedro mescaline uh, really helps to connect you with nature, which I think is a really effective way to have a rite of passage. Yeah, same same with mushrooms too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Also, you mentioned the connection with nature. I think that's an important thing as a society that we get back in touch with. Um, I mean, you see how we're operating now in America, just killing all the nature, poisoning all the water, doing all this crazy shit, you know? Um, I think psychedelics could help, you know, change that. You know, the mushroom will tell you, you know, to be with the nature and respect nature, and you are the nature, you know? Um, I think there's so many ways that psychedelics can be used in restructure, restructuring our society. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, they can restructure our society in many ways. The rite of passage thing is just one aspect of it. Like, I mean, we were talking about for this whole podcast really has been, you know, the answers that you can get to seemingly unanswerable questions, um, you know, a sense of something larger than yourself, um, you know, just a way to separate yourself from the systems that you were born into all those things are just so valuable to the growth and development of a human and you, we talk about the mental health issue in america i mean i guarantee you walk down the street nine out of ten people they're gonna say they have something wrong going on like everybody has uh depression or anxiety or if they don't, they're going to tell you about their trauma. Like everybody is carrying so much shit on their shoulders everywhere they go. And, you know, they feel like there's no way out. And they see this one narrow view of reality. Like this is what my reality is. I'm always going to be this way. There's no way out. And now with the research, it shows how incredible like psilocybin works with depression and anxiety and dealing with past traumas. Like ketamine is supposedly so good for dealing with uh, traumas in your past. These things that have been overlooked for so long can you know, be used as such an important tool to start healing a society that seems to be sick. I mean, if you really look at, at who we are, we are very sick in what we consume you know, physically, what we eat and drink, and also just mentally what we consume. Um, I think psychedelics are really good at telling you what you need to hear. And that's why it helps people with um, depression, anxiety, and like in my case, just changing my life. I think it tells you what you need to hear to make the right move, to change your trajectory that you're on. Because a lot of people feel stuck and they're just going down and down, downhill. And, you know, it could be one trip that just changes everything. And then the next day you've changed. Like you're shifted, a new reality is ahead of you. Yeah, if you keep carving out the same path in life day after day, over and over and over again, and you get so stuck that it feels like there's no way to dig yourself out of that hole because you're just so deep in it, psychedelics are 
one of the only things that I've I've come across that can blast you right out of that hole in a matter of minutes. Well, we'll say hours. Yeah. Because, I mean, we're told for the most part that, you know, you have depression. And if you have depression, it's part of your your uh, ancestry. It's genetically who you are. And it can't be changed. So what we have to do now is make you commit to taking a pill for the rest of your life to dull all your emotions. To Not only dulls your sadness, it also dulls your, like, talking antidepressants, they also dull your ability to feel, like, happiness and other emotions. It kind of just puts you on a, in like a lukewarm state. And it's funny because, well, it's not funny. It's just crazy that people are being fed this narrative. And I believe that, you know, the consciousness you hold is what creates your reality. So if you're telling yourself this narrative every day that you have depression and there's no way to cure it, then it's just going to keep going deeper and deeper and you're going to get stuck in it. Whereas if you take a psychedelic and it can show you, not just tell you, it's not a narrative that's just being fed to you. It can show you that you are not the depression. You aren't depressed, but it's okay to be depressed sometimes. Sometimes uh, on a mushroom trip, it'll give you a nice warm hug and let you know it'll be okay. You know, these things that people don't experience in their everyday lives can sometimes, it's not a cure-all, but for me it worked, and I know for a lot of other people it worked. Um, it's, it's pretty awesome that now we're finally starting to let this be acceptable in our society. And if it gets promoted properly and people are educated right about this, it could really change uh, the trajectory of our culture. You know, hopefully we start making changes. It's never going to happen very quickly. I mean, I think we got to get uh, a lot of the people in power to start taking these things or just elect people who are like minded and have maybe taken them and know what their actual capabilities are. And Yeah. And like you said, you know, as opposed to the taking a pill every day model, you don't have to have very many of these experiences for them to have a dramatic effect on your life. Um, you know, there are a lot of people still in my life that think that I'm a druggie, that I'm crazy because of, you know, taking psychedelics. And when I tell them, like, I only take them a handful of times a year, they're just like astounded. Like, oh, wait, what? That's not the normal uh, activities of a person addicted to fungi or, you know, some kind of a drug. And I'm like, you feel exactly like, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you feel the pressure that people put on you. Uh, that's completely unwarranted because it's not like that. You take them a few times a year if you do it responsibly and you can gain so much from that. Yeah, it, it can change your life. And this is like we're talking about all the ways it can change you in the physical ways, like your depression, the way you deal with life. But on top of it, and this is where I am, it's it's just made life fun. And it's given me this sense of adventure again that, you know, we can we individually have the ability to investigate reality and seek truth and it's not just your answers aren't just something you can write down on a piece of paper it's an answer that will be ingrained into your soul and become a part of you and then you can feel things that you've learned in a different way and you can see reality in a different a whole different mode like you know, if the Buddha was sitting right here in front of us, he would be seeing the same thing we're seeing. But he, in the same way, he wouldn't be because everything is recontextualized. You know, it's not like you become enlightened and everything looks different. It's just that you have a different understanding of everything you're seeing and interacting with. So it's amazing the way, you know, having these experiences can shift your mind and help you see things in a different way that, you know, maybe it's not the way I was taught and the way I believed so wholeheartedly everything was. And they also brought in your curiosity. Like for me, it made me curious and interested in so many other forms of philosophy. And it also helped me to be more receptive to those forms of philosophy, including, like you said earlier, religion. I was completely shut down uh, in terms of like how I thought about religion. I wouldn't accept any religious dogma or ideology at all. I, like you said, I thought it was just for children. 
which is crazy. It's ridiculous. Like it's so ego driven to, you know, to think that. And I can say that it's ego driven to think that because I was in that position and I know what it's like. And I understand now, uh, the motivations and the drivers that were deep inside my psyche that caused me to be like that. Um, you know, a need for approval, a need for external validation. That's why I would fight with people and try to prove my point and that I was right and they were wrong. It's just, and psychedelics, they allow you to break free of like the systematic paradigms that keep you ingrained into that little tunnel that you were talking about earlier. And, you know, for me, it's gotten me interested in some of the, you know, uh, philosophies and concepts and ideas that have changed everything about the way I view life. Yep. Uh, same here. Definitely gave me, like I mentioned, a sense of adventure. And it's so important to learn about yourself. It teaches you about yourself. And the more you look inward and you understand all these little things you've been ignoring inside your own ego and your own perspective, you can learn about yourself, which allows you to understand others, you know? So when I don't get so bogged down in my perspectives as I used to and defend myself in when it comes to concepts very like I don't try to defend myself as much when it comes to these things because you have to realize you know how you feel about it the person you're talking to across from you feels that same way if not deeper in their perspective they believe it as true and absolute as it is right there's they're just not understanding the right way they don't know what I know but, you know, it, it goes both ways. The more you understand yourself, the more you can have this true empathy for others and really understand that what they're experiencing is the same thing. You know, you can look at an individual and see what's behind the eyes. You know, it's not if if they're coming across in a certain way. I really use this a lot now when people are uh, like somebody almost hit me with their car the other day and I could have got pissed off and like threw my cup at their car and this and that. But I just, any negative action that comes out of somebody, it's because they're hurting, you know, in some sense. Nobody ever commits these horrible acts unless you're like a pure psychopath, but you don't ever come across as angry and uh, confrontational when you're in a happy, loving space. It just doesn't happen. So whenever somebody does something, like I, I've learned that about myself, you know, when you introspect, you realize, when I'm feeling really good about myself and everything around me, I don't have to shit on anybody else, you know? So when somebody shits on you, you have to realize that it's just them not feeling good about themselves. And that sounds, you know, so corny, like something your parents would tell you. But if you can really feel that, it's, it's, it really helps in life for me. Yeah, these experiences give you the capacity for compassion and unconditional love. And I think that's what we need to uh, to progress and further our evolution or we're probably going to not last for very much longer because we're coming to a head. You know, we are, as world power is starting to flirt with nuclear war, you know, we have this UFO, UAP thing coming to a head. Like, it just, it seems like there's there's a, a point at which, like, we're going to hit soon. Like we're coming up to the precipice of the singularity or something like that. And uh, the hope is that we can just sort of absorb enough wisdom, love and compassion to guide us towards something that can result in as little suffering as possible for, you know, as many people as possible. Yeah. It definitely feels like we're approaching like some fork in the road. And unfortunately looking at it from trying to step outside of it and look at it, it seems like we're going to walk along the path of, you know, AI, more technology, less nature. You know, there's kind of two ways you can go there. It doesn't seem like we're going to suddenly start to treat the planet better and, you know, maybe tone down on the technology. It doesn't seem like that's happening. Um, what, what is probably going to happen is way more of this, you know, what we're already doing now. I feel like it's going to be probably way, way worse before it gets better, but it will get better. And the only thing that, you know, worries me is I don't know if I'll be alive to see the better part. You know, there's always the fear that we're approaching something like it just feels this way. 
that we're approaching something really big. And I feel like it just the natural arc of this is that it's going to get worse before it gets better. When I think about how the meta system of, you know, this thing is possibly going to work out and my role in it, I like to think of, uh, you know, the Jack Cornfield quote. Uh, he said, tend to the part of the garden that you can touch. And that makes me feel a little better, you know, because what else can you do? Um, and when you start to think about, you know, like my role in the world and like my, my existential crisis, you know, that it feels like we're heading into, uh, you know, the abyss or whatever. I like to think of that because it just allows me to center myself back to what I am, what I can control, what makes me feel good. Um, I think Terrence McKenna, again, I bring him up too much, but um, he said something like, a guru isn't going to give you all the answers. You know, an ideology is not going to give you all the answers. What matters is direct experience. What matters is you, your friends, your family, you know, essentially the parts of your life that you can touch. That's what you have to concern yourself with. And I guess the philosophy is if we all tend to our gardens in the best way that we possibly can, then collectively, you know, we will have grown into something that's worth fighting for or, you know, worth sticking around for. Yeah, I love that. And it's the same thing as like uh, Jordan Peterson. He's like, uh, if you can't clean your room, don't try to clean up the planet. You Go know? to make your bed <laughs> or you're going to end up in the hospital. You're living in hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, but that's so true. It's like you have these people that are always angry at the world and trying to fix problems, but they never fix their own problems. They're the ones with the really messy room and the messed up head and whatever. And I know that because I was at that place. There was a point in my life where I was always angry at the world and not realizing that the world is a mirror. I'm just looking at a reflection. And, uh, but I love that quote because I, I really, I really resonate with it because I I remember the times where I used to, I thought I had anxiety, which I now realize you don't have, ang or at least I didn't have anxiety. I was just anxious all the time because I was thinking about things that I couldn't touch. And now I can sit back and talk about this and talk about that. I'm thinking we're probably heading towards something horrible, but don't actually feel the emotions of the future because I'm perfect right now. And most of the times where I, start to feel a negative emotion i can put myself in the now and just realize like wow everything is perfect right here you know because most of the time i'm not in agonizing pain or you know not truly suffering it's the real suffering that happens is usually just you in your own mind and so it's just now i'm able to just put myself in the now and even if i feel any type of uh anxiety or any type of negative emotion creeping in, I'll just sit there and do that 10 minute breath work. Like we just did a breath work before we started and I'll do that. And it's crazy because you just end up sitting there and then you realize how perfect you feel in the moment. Once you just empty your mind and just be in the now, it's, it's just kind of relieves everything around you. And if everything is perfect in this moment, and the only thing that exists is this moment, that means that it's all perfect. It always has been, always will be. Yeah. <laughs>